we are live now yes good evening friends welcome to the 23rd webinar of the posi uh, today we have with us a uh, tom novacek from gillet children's Mul uh, multi speciality hospital from uh, minnesota uh, he will be speaking to us on what is new in the management of ambulatory cerebral palsy children he is from gillet children's speciality hospital and that is a 122 years old hospital and uh, he's with this hospital for last 31 years actually he take over the legacy of a very famous doctor jim gage who is a, who was a pioneer in gait analysis in cerebral palsy basically uh, i have selected a very unique way of introducing tom novacek uh, i have asked his friend who has worked with him for so many years and what they say about him that I'm going to share with you. So I asked Freeman Miller and he said that uh, his biggest contribution in the field of cerebral palsy is that he has done a longitudinal study about the selective dorsal rhizotomy and what is the effect on these children. And secondly, the outcome measures regarding the femoral derotation osteotomy that also he has studied really uh, long term and that's his major contribution in the field of cerebral palsy. The Carl Graham from Australia said that he's an excellent teacher, very good researcher and mentor. He values family, friendship and fellowship. He's an excellent surgeon and a great team leader. Then the unique guest, the Paolo Solber, he's uh, with us today. And he said that he's a shy person, but very dedicated, very methodical and with a very sound biomechanical concept. So that's what people say about him. There are two major contributions. Uh, the book, which is we consider as a Bible in cerebral palsy management. Uh, that is a second edition book, which he wrote, I think, 11 years back. And I'm sure that every pediatric orthopedic surgeon who is interested in cerebral palsy should read this book. The one new book, which is for the family that published uh, this year only, the spastic diplegia, bilateral cerebral palsy, that's written by one of the parents, and he is also editor of that book. Now, every surgeon has a life beyond orthopedics, and there is also something very special and unique about him. He grows grapes in his farm, and from that he makes a wine. So anyone who is interested to know about how to make wine from grapes, uh, you can always inquire with the Tom. So with that, I give uh, now uh, mic to Tom, and I also welcome uh, our another uh, old friend of POSI, that's Paolo Salber. Initially, he was at uh, RCH Melbourne, and now he has migrated to USA. So he's also with us on a Zoom meeting. So uh, we will also have some input uh, from Paolo at the end of the session. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very nice introduction. Um, I'm very humbled by that. I uh, did grow up on a farm and I, that is my peaceful place. Uh, I wish my grapes looked as good as the pictures that you showed, Doreen. Um, this is a very big uh, topic. I've really struggled to decide what to, uh, to talk about today because we could talk for a long, long time. Uh, and I hope that we can get to most of the information that I have listed here. So we're first of all I'm going to start out with classification, measurement, and outcomes assessment and review the current status. Uh, we'll do a little brief warning of some things not to do in CP. So often when we're getting lectures, we hear about what to do, but maybe it's also very important to talk about what not to do. Hip dysplasia we'll cover. We'll talk a little bit about knee contracture and crouch gait, different treatment options a little bit about the current status of foot reconstruction and then focus on the long-term outcome studies that Doreen mentioned, uh, and then uh, also finish a little bit with, uh, with the muscle. Uh, as Doreen mentioned, I've been at Gillette Children's since 1991. Uh, the, um, I owe a, a world of gratitude to Dr. Gage, my senior mentor, uh, without whom I would not be uh, here today speaking with you. 
So first of all, classification and outcomes assessment. We'll talk a, a little bit about GMFCS, the goal, CP child, CPRN, and other uh, measures. So hopefully everyone in the audience is familiar with GMFCS. Uh, this is a very useful communication and classification scheme uh, for children functioning at higher levels on various surfaces, stairs, GMFCS2, independently ambulatory, but struggling a little bit more. GMFCS3, main mobility is with assistive devices. GMFCS4 is mainly uh, exercise ambulation and short distance in the home. And GMFCS5 is the use of the wheelchair. So hopefully none of that is new. It's a very useful communication classification scheme. We know that many things are related to GMFCS. This is uh, Care Graham's uh, uh, bar graph uh, about uh, the incidence of hip dysplasia by GMFCS uh, level. Uh, very useful uh, differentiation. Uni Narayan has played a critical role in the CP world. One of his contributions is the development of the CP child published now almost 15 years ago. It's in a questionnaire uh, that has parent and child forms. There are uh, six different domains. Uh, and this is mainly for the more affected individual with cerebral palsy, mainly the GMFCS four and five patient. It has been shown to correlate very well with GMFCS. So GMFCS one through five and decreasing uh, scores. Uh, so there is a bit of a ceiling effect for the more functional patients, but for the less functional, a very useful tool. Also a contribution from Uni uh, Narayan and his group is the goal, the gate outcomes assessment list, which is really geared towards the more mobile individual. It is similarly designed. It asks about ADLs, gait function and mobility, pain, discomfort and fatigue, physical activities, gait appearance, the use of devices and body image and self-esteem. It's organized like this, where you, uh, the individual rates how hard or easy it is to do any particular skill, the level of assistance that they have with this, and how important a goal it is uh, to uh, try to improve that with intervention. And this is what a full page of it looks like for gait function and mobility. So it's walking distances, indoors, ar uh, around the house, more uh, longer distances, faster around obstacles, up and down stairs, et cetera. Again, rating the difficulty, how much assistance is used and whether it's a goal. Very useful tool. We are starting to use that at our hospital. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about gait analysis to highlight uh, the recent work done about quality, reliability and utility. One of the biggest advancements in my mind about quality is the use of the functional gait model. The standard gait model uh, is dependent upon how accurately the uh, tester places the markers. This system, however, doesn't, we don't tell the computer where the joints and joint centers and axes are. We ask the computer to tell us. So we do these functional ranges of movement and we trace the malleoli and that's the way that we create the model to measure the joint kinematics and kinetics. So if you wanted to ask yourself, what about tibial torsion? The way we do it is we look at the point in time in the gait cycle when the knee is in most extension, and we look at the transverse plane offset between the uh, knee joint axis and the bimalleolar axis, knowing that the normal is 10 to 15 degrees. So that if we get a patient's data that looks like this, it's instead offset by 30 degrees, we can say that there's a 15 to 20 degree abnormal tibial torsion. And then when we go to surgery to correct it, um, in this case, the patient is on the stomach. So the foot is up and the knee is down. Uh, I'm drilling uh, guide wires into the tibia through the holes in the plate. And I'm setting that angle at, a, at the converging angle that I, uh, to, corresponds to the amount of derotation that we want to do so that uh, we can very uh, directly translate the measurement from the gait analysis system into the operating room to guide in a very accurate way the amount of derotation that we're going to accomplish. So after the drill holes are done, the osteotomy is done, the derotation can be accomplished. We know that the osteotomy is free. 
we can reinsert the pins and we can correct the tibial torsion until they're well aligned and complete the fixation. So a huge advancement in my mind. This study that we did a few years ago, we were looking at the consistency of problem identification and treatment recommendations amongst the interpreters. For a medical test to be useful, it has to be reliable, it has to alter decision making, and has to improve outcomes. It's been shown in the past that it does change decision making, and it leads to improvements. The reliability, however, has been questioned. We started a quality assurance program in 2014 where quarterly all of the interpreters looked at the same case and they were asked to identify the problems and make treatment recommendations. This was all at our institution, so it's a single institution with multiple interpreters. Here's our group of uh, interpreters. There's seven orthopedic surgeons. We had a lot of experience with 3D gait analysis data and we've expanded that group more recently to be a larger group. Again, we had one patient's 3D gait analysis. The data that I'm gonna show you is over three years time, mainly with cerebral palsy. Uh, each case is presented to us in the routine way. We don't have any other interpreters present. We have all the usual data to review. We're not blinded to the fact that it's a consistency case or who the referring physician is, but we're blinded to anything that happens subsequently and any other decisions that were made based on that gait analysis. We were then asked to rate the bony deformities, the soft tissue issues, and the range of motion dynamic problems for all the problems. This is what our uh, form looks like. We enter whether it's present on the left, the right, both, neither, or unsure. For the treatment recommendations, we had to make decisions about rhizotomy and baclofen pump, bony surgical corrections, the usual procedures that we do for CP, and also the usual soft tissue procedures to be considered. Again, we have a similar tool to be able to make our recommendations based on that test. We looked at percent agreement to evaluate the consistency and made a composite score. For the problem identification, you can see that we had 15 patients, seven interpreters, 25 problems. So there's uh, over 2,500 responses. And the percent agreement is 85 to 90%. No interpreter was different from any other interpreter. For the bony problems, the percent agreement was similar to the soft tissue problems. We had very good consistency for sagittal plane hip and knee problems and lower for issues with balance and dystonia. For the treatments, again, over 2000 responses. We averaged five and a half procedures recommended per patient. And again, a very high percentage of agreement, over 90%. And again, no interpreter was different from the other. So we concluded from this that if you have a group of experienced physician interpreters of gait data at a single center, that you can have moderate to substantial agreement for many problems and common treatments. We thought that that good agreement was important for improving consistent care and establishing the reliability of gait analysis as a tool for clinical decision making. I also wanna talk about something else that's uh, coming on the scene. Uh, we're using it at Gillette in a high number of our patients for spinal deformity and lower extremity uh, deformity, and that's EOS. This is low dose simultaneous uh, biplanar uh, radiographs. You can see the machine and the machine uh, can create a model uh, for the individual's lower extremity alignment uh, for the uh, for bony alignment and this is what the uh, x-rays look like for a patient of mine who had bilateral distal femur osteotomies and all the modeling that's done and the type of data that we get. So the good thing is, is you have lengths, you have angles of the neck shaft, coronal plane knee, mechanical axis, and most importantly, with low dose radiation, measurements of femoral torsion and tibial torsion and we've uh, looked at this very carefully 
and we have a good degree of confidence in the data and we're starting to incorporate that into our decision making algorithm as well. I also wanted to mention that there are multi, multi center groups, international groups. Uh, the first group, CHOP, uh, is looking at uh, CP HIP outcomes. And the second group is more related to GATE. Uh, so it's uh, more uh, ambulatory. So the first group would be the GMFCS 4 and 5 patients, the second group, the uh, GMFCS 1, 2, and 3 mainly. Um, these are uh, essentially uh, large groups uh, using a common database in order to be able to do comparative outcomes effectiveness research. And, uh, and hopefully uh, we can start to see which treatments are working better than others and, and despite the institutional uh, variation. I wanted to briefly also mention pain. We've been doing a poor job in the field measuring pain. Uh, some recent work that we've done based on a rudimentary tool for measuring pain shows that pain is not correlated to crouch. It is correlated to the presence of patella alta, but it's not clearly improved with surgery. And in fact, there can be new pain that occurs after surgery. This, uh, the tool that we used was again, fairly rudimentary. Uh, we're implementing some better tools. Uh, and I think as we think about our patients and that many of the indications for the surgeries that we do are not just alignment, but also could be for comfort, we need to do a better job of doing all of these measurements. So I wanted to mention that. I wanna move on to what not to do. So this is a fairly brief list. It's not all inclusive, but hopefully it has some highlights. It includes doing stage surgery, lengthening muscles that shouldn't be lengthened because they are important power generators lengthening muscles that aren't short. And there are some notable examples about that and the hamstrings is one of them. Doing neurectomies, doing most complete tendon transfers in the, in the foot. So we know about the stage surgery. This is Dr. Rang's uh, diagram uh, where one year the heel cord is lengthened, the next year the hamstrings are lengthened, the next year the hip flexors are lengthened. And we believe that the final outcome isn't as good as if they're all done together. Uh, so this is a motivation for doing uh, multiple procedures under one anesthetic. We also advocate against percutaneous tenotomies. They've been shown to be uncontrolled. This is a patient who had percutaneous tenotomies before he came to see us. It's attractive because it looks benign. It's easy to do. Uh, it has a short hospital stay. So parents are really interested in it but it's really like removing the, the power generators from lower extremity gait. So I showed you the early video. And then when we saw that individual a few years later, he looks like this. And he'd actually had percutaneous tenotomies of the heel cord and hamstrings on two to three occasions bilaterally. And, you, and he had no bony realignment surgery. So you can see the amount of instability that he has, the degree of weakness that he has, the bony malalignment, and the hyperextension and the anterior pelvic tilt related to the fact that he had the percutaneous uh, procedures, which again, look attractive, but have adverse long-term consequences. So we feel that they are unsafe to do. You should never do a tendo Achilles lengthening for a bilaterally involved patient. The soleus is a very important stance phase stabilizer. It helps to keep the tibia upright and if you do a heel cord lengthening, the tibia tends to fall forward because of the lack of second rocker ankle restraint and the uh, uh, ankle plantar flexors are weakened and crouch is what occurs. So don't lengthen the soleus in a cerebral palsy patient. It can, and in this patient, this is a mixed tone patient. It can, really can be disastrous. So now this patient is in the uh, calcaneus gait with no forefoot weight bearing. Um, the, uh, so differentiating the different types of tone is also extremely important. Tendon transfers in the foot. Complete transfers are procedures that were developed for other pathologies, uh, such as myelomeningocele and uh, polio. But split transfers are safer if you're going to do a tendon transfer. This patient had a posterior tibialis tendon transfer through the interosseous membrane on the right. And again, this was a procedure uh, that was used in spastic hemiplegics. 
uh, Leon Root, who is uh, now uh, passed away, was initially an advocate of this uh, procedure, uh, but he found uh, after he followed his patients that uh, they had overcorrection into calcaneus. Uh, well, and while this procedure may have been a good su surgery for polio, was found not to be a good procedure for cerebral palsy, and he did retract his uh, support for this procedure uh, uh, later in life. Overlengthened hamstrings is a major problem. One of the big problems with overlengthened hamstrings is that we don't have a good option for correcting it once it's done. This patient had hamstring lengthenings either excessively or inappropriately because maybe they weren't short in the first place. And now you can see the recurvatum and the anterior pelvic tilt. In addition, if they have rectus femoris spasticity and contracture, you've now unbalanced the joints in addition to lengthening a muscle too much. There really isn't a good solution for overlengthened hamstrings. Uh, they can have severe problems with lordosis and uh, you may have some things that you can do, uh, but it's pretty limited. So I think one of the most important things is for any procedure that you're going to do, make sure that you have a backup plan in case something goes wrong. The good news about bony osteotomy surgery is if there's an overcorrection or undercorrection or a new deformity that's developed, that can be corrected. You can go back, you don't like to go back, but you can go back and correct that. So there are good options for corrections after bony surgery. Unfortunately, for many of the soft tissue procedures, we don't have great options. Another thing to be aware of is not to do so much botulinum toxin. And there are many centers, including ours, where we're guilty of that. Uh, it's, it seems, again, easy. It's like the percutaneous tenotomies. Easy to do, a lot of people can do it. Uh, seem to be low risk, but we've now learned that it's not low risk. We've known for a long time that there's denervation, that it's temporary and re occurs. But if there's numerous repeated injections, this denervation re cycle leads to sarcopenia, fibrosis, and weakness. Kara Graham, again, uh, was an advocate uh, for uh, botulinum toxin and he has become an advocate against the overuse of botulinum toxin. And this has been an important aspect of his research and uh, teaching work in the past few years. So we'll move on to hip dysplasia. There are two critical elements about the femoral uh, bone deformity, that's anaversion and increased neck shaft angle. We know that the anaversion is persistence of fetal alignment uh, and that the neck shaft angle can be markedly increased. Uh, compared to the normal, and that this contributes to uh, the hip dysplasia. We know that this does vary depending upon GMFCS level too, so that again, the hip displacement risk is much higher for GMFCS 4 and 5. The femoral neck anaversion doesn't change that much between GMFCS levels, but the neck shaft angle does. So when you're thinking about doing your femur osteotomy, you should be thinking about whether you, uh, which GMFCS uh, level your patient is in order to design the correct degree of correction in the transverse plane and in the coronal plane. Does hip displacement matter? Well, the CP child is actually now showing that it is, that the, based on the CP child, there's a decrease in the, CP, in the CP child scores with increasing hip displacement. So the worse the hip, the lower the CP child score. And also that the CP child is responsive and sensitive to change following hip reconstructive surgery and following spine surgery. So this is good evidence that the CP child is now finally a good tool for us to be able to use for measuring outcomes of two very important intervention, interventions that we have for our GMFCS four and five patients, the uh, reconstruction of the hip and the spinal reconstruction. When we're doing hip surgery for CP, we're trying to avoid getting to this point. This hip is essentially non-reconstructable, probably is non-reconstructable, probably would need a hip replacement uh, at this point, depending upon the patient's functional level. Because if you look at the femoral head, uh, at the time of a surgery, uh, there's a lot, a lot of damage. And this can be avoided if we intervene at the right time before it becomes too late. In our mind at Gillette, tone management differs, de de 
uh, depending upon GMFCS level. For our, many of our GMFCS 1, 2, and 3 patients, they may be considered uh, candidates for selective dorsal rhizotomy. And uh, for the less functional patients, uh, the intrathecal baclofen pump. There's a difference between spasticity and dystonia. You need to train yourself about this. Uh, there are tools to measure dystonia. And uh, the baclofen pump, uh, we have a large group of patients. The advantage uh, over rhizotomy is that it's reversible. Uh, it has a much bigger effect uh, intrathecally than orally. Uh, the, one of the problems is withdrawal and withdrawal uh, with baclofen pump failure can be really severe. Uh, yet despite that, patients are highly satisfied in general. Uh, again, it is adjustable. The pump itself is not the problem. The pump is reliable and durable. The uh, problems occur with infection, uh, wound problems, and catheter problems. For the ambulatory patients, when the pump first came out in the 1990s, we tried it for some GMFCS 2 and 3 patients. We were not pleased with the results at our center. Uh, we didn't feel like we see, saw the same degree of improvement as we do with SDR, so we abandoned doing it for those patients. It's best for uh, more severely affected patients with dystonia and mixed tone who have goals for comfort and positioning, not for gait. If we have a patient who meets the candidate for SDR, we would prefer to do the SDR. Again, this is mainly for gait goals in GMFCS 1, 2, and 3. We have a highly selective procedure uh, process. Uh, we have a specific procedure that hasn't changed over the course of a long period of time. We have seen no reason to change it, and we've been studying the outcomes both short-term and long-term. <clears throat> The candidacy is uh, much like what uh, Dr. Peacock first advocated for. We have many patients who are not good candidates and we don't recommend rhizotomy, but we do recommend it for the patients who are uh, the best candidates. This is an easy one for us. Uh, very highly functional patients, GMFCS1, but very spastic. This is his video before and after the SDR. The only procedure that he had in addition to the SDR is a single uh, one-sided gastric nemius recession. But it is destructive and irreversible. Uh, CP is not the same across all individuals, of course. Bad results have been uh, uh, reported, but we believe that much of that is related to poor patient selection. In some cases, excessive rhizotomies. I should mention that our institution, we perform 25 to 40% rhizotomies. We find that that's very effective in treating the spasticity. Uh, and some institutions are doing as much as 60 to 80% rhizotomy, and we see some bad results from that. Sometimes the wrong nerve root levels are selected, and sometimes a patient is a good candidate and they have a good operation, but they don't have their lever arms corrected, and they can also have a bad outcome that's blamed on the SDR, but it really should be blamed on the fact that you didn't do the right orthopedic surgery. The selection process is rigorous. We look at all of these uh, issues and we rate the patient depend, uh, as a good candidate or a bad candidate on all of them. Uh, so the more smiley faces you have on the right, the more likely you're going to have a recommendation of rhizotomy from our team. So coming back to hip surveillance, uh, hip surveillance does differ. Uh, so for the milder levels, you've got some very specific parameters. Uh, these are the parameters from the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy Developmental Medicine. Uh, algorithm. There are other algorithms that are used in Canada, in uh, uh, Scandinavia, and in Australia. Uh, so you can, um, uh, there are some slight nuanced differences between them, uh, but you can basically decide, and if you can institute a hip surveillance program, um, and I don't know what your status of that is in India, but uh, if you can, if you don't have it and you can try to do it, uh, that's a big advantage to, to your patients. And I'm not going to go through all the details of these things because, again, it's, it's um, uh, a lot of detail. You can find all of this uh, published uh, readily. So in terms of the hip, uh, there are different treatment options. Let's look at some of these different options depending upon GMFCS level. So for the GMFCS 4 and 5, maybe it's more uh, release of more muscle, uh, more aggressive procedures to the uh, adductors in particular, and in the GMFCS 1 to 3, who have, in addition to maybe hip dysplasia, having gait goals, should be much more conservative and uh, particularly preserving the adductor brevis to maintain the stability of the pelvis after surgery. 
The procedure for the femur is also slightly different. Uh, so a greater correction of neck shaft angle in the more severely affected patients with more shortening uh, than in the ambulatory patients in whom you should minimize the varicization. The appropriate pelvic osteotomy for uh, the individuals uh, can, can be very much the same uh, and weight bearing status can be very different. Here's an example of a GMFCS2 patient without hip dysplasia, then was developing worsening hip dysplasia and by age five had about 45% uh, uncoverage by Reimer's index on the left side. In this case, I performed a femur uh, uh, osteotomy that was uh, slightly varicizing, but mainly derotation. Uh, this patient, a more severely affected patient, GMFCS4 and slightly older, the Reimer's migration percentage was worse. We use arthrograms frequently. We use it at rest to see uh, how, uh, how the congruity looks. And we do a stress view to assess the uh, stability in surgery. So I would have had this patient scheduled for a possible pelvic osteotomy on that right side. But based on that arthrogram, I decided not to. And that patient has maintained a good result uh, now up to six years afterwards. And you can see that subsequently the patient uh, did receive a baclofen pump as well. We've also published about the use of the periacetabular osteotomy uh, in an antiverted position for the treatment of posterior hip dysplasia. Uh, this was uh, published in 2018, Journal uh, of Pediatric Orthopedics. Uh, we had 35 neuromuscular patients. Uh, they were almost all posterolateral deficient. So this is a big difference uh, compared to our idiopathic patient population who are mainly anterolateral. So the vast purport, uh, per high percentage of these patients are posterolateral deficient. Uh, this report included not only the hip reconstruction, but also uh, other uh, parts of the treatment for ambulation. Uh, and, and we uh, assessed our results using the anterior wall index and the posterior wall index pre to post operatively. And uh, that uh, report is the largest group of CP patients with spastic hip subluxation treated by PAO. Uh, the anaverting PAO showed that it was powerfully able to improve the posterior lateral insufficiency and that we were able to do it safely as part of a Semmel's procedure for treatment of other problems related to gait. Let's move down to the knee uh, and uh, knee contracture, crouch gait, and look briefly at growth modulation and DFEO PTA. So with knee contracture, if you have growth remaining, uh, we have shown that anterior distal femoral hemiopiphysiodesis works. You need to pick it, uh, doing it at the right age uh, and the uh, correct degree of severity uh, so that you can get a good outcome. In this particular case, we use the anterior eight plates in other cases, uh, uh, for patient comfort considerations, uh, we use the percutaneously placed anterior hemiopiphyseal screws, and uh, both are effective. I find this procedure to be easy for me, harder for patients, and this procedure harder for me, easier for patients. What I've come to doing uh, is counseling families that patients will be uncomfortable with these plates for uh, six weeks to three months after the surgery. And even our ambulatory non cerebral palsy patients who have eight plates around their knees walk with stiffness. So as long as families are prepared for that and they don't uh, get too concerned about that too early on, uh, and they just let some time go by, in my experience, this is still an acceptable uh, procedure. Our outcomes paper uh, documented the greater degree of effectiveness with the more anterior placement of the implant. So the further back you go, and it makes sense, the less effective it is. So make sure that whatever implant you use, you place it very far anterior, just off the patellofemoral joint. And Dorin, I have to thank you for these uh, animations. Uh, you gave them to me a few years ago and, uh, and I have used them. I find them very useful for education. So this is about the distal femoral extension osteotomy, removing the anterior distal wedge from the femur, 
correcting that uh, to immediately correct the knee contracture. And then for the patellar uh, advancement procedure, in this case, a tibial tubercle advancement, uh, osteotomizing the tibial tubercle, creating your tension band, uh, which for us, we use the fiber tape and maybe you use something else. You pull the patella down to the desired position, create a spot for the tibial tubercle and insert it into the proper position. The technical outcome is clear. The patient's preoperative knee contracture, we take these x-rays in maximum extension supine and also the patellar position. After the surgery, you can see the osteotomy, the immediate correction, uh, the full correction of the femoral tibial angle and the lowering of the patella. And we've shown previously that uh, for the um, a DFEO only is only partly effective and not adequately effective. So we no longer advocate for doing the DFEO alone. If we're going to do a DFEO, we do the PTA so that the preoperative knee flexion curve can come down to the normal range. If the patient, however, has no fixed knee contracture prior to surgery, but they have an extension lag and patella alta, you can do a PTA only with equally good results. And these were our short-term results. Uh, so we found that the D PTA is necessary either uh, by itself without knee contracture or with the DFEO if there is a knee contracture. Um, there's still debate about what to do with the rectus femoris. Um, the typical scenario is periadolescent or young adult, crouch gait, oftentimes after failed previous procedures. We have to recognize that almost all of our patients have weak ankle plantar flexors and uh, that pain and patellar stress fractures are common, but not the usual indication for the procedure. Okay, we're gonna move down to the foot and uh, talk about treating the plano valgus foot, the in unstable foot. The guiding principle here is to help the foot be a proper lever arm so that the ankle plantar flexors can participate in the plantar flexion knee extension couple. One of the things that we find very important is to evaluate the foot in non-weight-bearing subtalar joint neutral uh, to be able to assess the non-weight-bearing foot position. And we have found that that helps us understand that the primary deformity is not in the hind foot, but is in the midfoot and forefoot. So that same foot in weight-bearing looks very bad in valgus, but in non-weight-bearing shows no hind foot valgus. So that's really a midfoot instability and a forefoot deformity problem. And it has helped us and many other centers have moved away from treating the hind foot directly because that's the compensation and more towards treating the midfoot and the forefoot. In our hands, there are bad orthoses. And this is an example where the, an x-ray taken in a weight bearing position in the orthosis still shows severe deformity. Uh, whereas in a non-weight bearing position, you should be able to brace that foot and maintain that alignment. Uh, that takes a foot plate like this. This is the type that we use that provides the lateral forefoot support and the medial uh, posting. And uh, by doing that mold in the uh, subtalar joint neutral non-weight bearing position, we're able to achieve that. So this is a pre and a post uh, alignment uh, patient uh, who has that type of orthosis. So, and the x-ray. Surgically, uh, the gastrocnemius, either Bauman, Strayer, or Baker is, is almost always what's needed. Uh, their structural foot realignment, as I mentioned, it used to be hind foot. Uh, uh, many years ago, we started uh, doing the oscalsis, but we found that that wasn't enough. So we started to add the plantar flexion osteotomy and for some patients who have poor motor control, the tail and navicular arthrodesis, and for the more functional patients, we even, uh, many centers, including us, started to add the third C, which is the calcaneal medialization uh, part as well. And uh, certainly for a salvage case, in a more severe case, uh, triple arthrodesis is an option. So I think you know that the gastrocnemius recession, the strayer is just at the muscular tendinous junction. Uh, preserving the soleus, but lengthening the gastrocnemius. And again, a vote to say that in an ambulatory bilateral patient, tendo Achilles lengthening should essentially never be done. And the surgical details here about how to do the ascalsis lengthening and some animations to show how it works. And the same thing for the first cuneiform plantar flexion osteotomy to bring the forefoot down to the floor 
and a medialization osteotomy of the calcaneus. Those are the three mainstay osteotomies. Taylor navicular arthrodesis, uh, lots of detail here. I'm not going to have time to, to show all the details about this particular patient. Uh, uh, this was a failed uh, oscalsis lengthening. Uh, so we did a, a, a repeat oscalsis lengthening and a, a Taylor navicular fusion uh, with a gastrocnemius recession with uh, preoperative uh, photos above and the postoperative photos below showing the correction. So this is a very powerful procedure. It's very effective. If you really want to assure your patient that you're going to have a, a very good outcome, doing the uh, fusion is uh, safer, but it does lead to the stiffness. So we try to avoid it when we can uh, and use it as a salvage operation. So there is certainly bad bracing and uh, beware of the skew foot though. There's four foot adductus in this patient and I didn't recognize that when I did this operation many years ago. And after the oscalsis lengthening, you can see that the hind foot and midfoot are well aligned, but the forefoot is in significant adduction. Distal tibial valgus is also present in some patients and can be a cause of failure of foot reconstruction. So we've uh, done a multi-segment foot model as well. This is a complex study. I'm just going to be able to brush over it very briefly. We used uh, physical examination uh, for forefoot varus and midfoot collapse. Uh, and we also uh, used uh, x-rays and multi-segment uh, foot data. This was an ambulatory cerebral palsy patient group. Uh, the patients who had surgery had the uh, calcaneal osteotomy and the first cuneiform osteotomy, the control group was non-surgical, and this was all at our institution. Uh, so we did a comparison uh, and we used the multi-segment foot bottle by Lardini as well as physical examination and uh, weight-bearing foot x-rays. And our findings, uh, I'm not showing you any of the data here, uh, interest of time, but uh, the findings show that improved foot structure did lead to improved foot kinematics. The control group was unchanged, uh, so they did not get any better or worse. Uh, but in, for our surgical patients, we found that some of our patients needed even a more aggressive surgical approach. And this has led us to add the uh, calcaneal medialization osteotomy to that algorithm. And we have yet to study the effectiveness of whether that's uh, led to further improvements. So the take home for the foot is that you're trying to improve the biomechanical position of the foot so it can function as a proper lever arm to contribute to the plantar flexion knee extension couple. So I'm gonna finish essentially with long-term outcomes. Again, I won't be able to show you all the data here, but we've uh, done long-term comparative studies to a retrospectively matched control group for these three major procedures, the DFEO PTA, the SDR, and the FDO. So first of all, for the DFEO PTA, we wanted to look at long-term benefits. Uh, and again, the study design uh, we had baseline gait analysis, retrospectively matched patients based on knee flexion angle and knee contracture during gait. And then we did a long-term study, a minimum of 10 years, uh, sorry, eight years. And we used multiple outcome variables to be able to measure the uh, um, uh, deformity aspects, as well as functional aspects, radiographic uh, pain and function and participation. So here's our groups. Uh, we had short-term and long-term analysis uh, for both groups. And you can see that they were similar ages before and after. Uh, so they are now young adult in their mid twenties. And the GMFCS levels uh, were similar across the two groups. And their pre-kinematics, uh, the DFEO PTA group slightly worse in crouch prior to surgery. And afterwards, the DFEO PTA group better than uh, at long term than the non DFEO non DFEO PTA group. So a significant improvement in the kinematics, uh, and a significant improvement in crouch for the DFEO PTA group compared to the non DFEO PTA group. And the short term results are maintained also in the long term for the most part. There's a little bit of decline in the GDI scores and a slight deterioration in the crouch kinematics. The knee moments also maintained and improved with the intervention, more so with the DFEO PTA. 
energy consumption really was not different, uh, except that there was a difference between groups prior to the surgery and the knee contracture uh, improved more for the DFEO PTA group, as you can imagine, compared to pre to long-term extensor lag, similar results, and patella alta also improved with the procedure. So the, the uh, physical exam and uh, impairment level uh, problems are significantly improved. Uh, the x-ray measurements, the Cushino index also improved. Osteoarthritis was no different. In terms of questionnaires, using the FAQ10, uh, there was no difference between the two groups before or after. The satisfaction with life, also no difference. Quality of life, no difference. Frequency of participation, no difference. Pain, all these parameters, no difference, particularly for the knee. Pain interference scores, no difference between the groups. And again, I mentioned before that we need to do a better job of measuring pain. And this is one of our first studies that we did a better job using pain severity, intensity, and interference, uh, and also pain type. There was a slight difference you see in some of the uh, standardized scores for uh, pain with transfers and sitting between the two groups. So there are some limitations uh, as there is with almost all uh, studies like this. But again, it's really uh, was a, a look at the long-term benefit on body structure and function. And clearly that was better for the DFEO PTA group, but these other things were equal between the two groups for activities, participation, and quality of life. Pain was pretty much equal. Maintenance of gait was mainly. SDR long-term. We've been doing them for a long time. Almost all the outcome studies have been short-term. There are a few long-term, none have a proper control group. So we did a 10 to 17 year follow-up with these multiple parameters again, across multiple domains of the ICF. Uh, and uh, wanted to look at this compared to alternative uh, treatments. Uh, and our hypothesis is that the SDR patients would have better outcomes and fewer subsequent treatments. Again, these are diplegic patients uh, followed up minimum of eight years. They were 16 to 25 years at uh, follow-up. We retrospectively matched using the random forest algorithm uh, so that we had a good match between our individuals. And again, this is a very busy slide. Um, so I'm just going to be able, have to go through that. So we get, did these satisfaction with life, quality of life, pain, participation, function, mobility. So here's our groups. Clinically, they were very similar uh, prior to the uh, intervention. So at baseline, they were well-matched. Uh, GDIs at baseline uh, were matched. Uh, the results at long-term are that the, clearly the SDR group had a marked difference in their tone, essentially complete normalization with uh, Ashworth scores of one uh, and residual high tone in the non-SDR group. Both groups improved on their GDI. Uh, both groups improved their knee kinematics we found no difference on the surveys, uh, but the good news is, is that both groups had low pain interference, high quality of life, and had similar FAQs. The energy had a greater improvement with the STR compared to the control group. There was a big difference in the amount of subsequent treatment as we hypothesized that the STR group had less subsequent treatment both for soft tissues and bony procedures and a lot less of injectable medications uh, after the procedure. There's some, a little bit of evidence of GMFCS here. I'm just gonna skim over that. So this was a unique study design with a control group, similar good outcomes, better GDI and better GMFCS, uh, better GDI for the controls, better GMFCS and uh, spasticity for the SDR. Uh, the control group had received much more treatment subsequently. Uh, we've subsequently got, gone on to doing a multi-center study uh, to do a better job of that one. Finally, with the FDO, um, our patients many times have abnormal antiversion, internal hip rotation, and intoing. Uh, the goal of the external derotation osteotomy is to normalize hip rotation in the short and long term, and we wanted to assess the potential benefit compared to a matched non-FDO group. We looked at radiographic parameters and gait outcomes. Uh, and, and wanted to be sure that they were matched at baseline. Uh, so here's our inclusion uh, criteria. Again, a long-term and retrospectively matched 
uh, group, uh, those with and those without FDO. Uh, so lots of data here, uh, 50 FDO patients, not as many non-FDO patients. We weren't able to find as many uh, midterm results, uh, long-term for the procedure, but still they're uh, young adults at this point. Uh, Anaversion, mean stance, hip rotation, and tonus angle all improved um, in all groups, but it improved more in the FDO group. The Reimer's migration percentage improved in the FDO group, uh, did not in the non-FDO group. The hip abductor moment was one of the things we were hoping was going to be better with the FDO, but it was not. Uh, and there were no other differences, the so long-term and other variables. So here's some of the data, uh, the non-FDO group pre to post, you can see actually that the antiversion does improve over time, even without derotation. That was really interesting. Uh, with the FDO, there's a big improvement in the uh, antiversion. So the FDO is similar to normal. Um, the hip rotation improved in both groups. So abnormally internal in both groups uh, to normalized uh, in both. And the hip abductor moment, uh, was not different. So again, the radiographs showed the rhymers improved in the FDO group alone, uh, and uh, it was not true. It was true also in the GMFCS three and four patients. So, in the long term, uh, the improvements with the FDO are improved or maintained over the long term. We didn't have recurrence problems. Uh, but, it, but it may not be necessary to derotate those patients to improve the uh, hip rotation, abductor moment, and work capacity uh, in the GMFCS1 and 2 patients, but you get a faster result if you do the FDO. Very finally, there needs to be more attention in our work on the muscle, the muscle function, the muscle histology, and the muscle epigenetics all are under study, and they have been understudied and we need to do a bigger job of that. Rick Lieber is a leader in this area, and I wanted to mention that as the final, and I'm excited for the future as we learn more about the muscle uh, physiology, histology, and epigenetics. So with that, uh, I, I thank you for your time, and I uh, am hopeful that we'll have many questions. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Tom. That was truly exhaustive, and I guess you covered everything. It was sort of a mini oration, and I'm sure that uh, people won't be able to take in so much information, and uh, it, it was really a wonderful uh, overview of everything that is there to CP. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, there are a lot of questions. So I'll set the ball rolling with a few questions. Uh, a lot of questions are related to soft tissue surgery, Tom, because uh, we don't have as effective as orthotics as you showed. And uh, most of us, or I would rather say none of us do SDRs. So probably we are still doing soft tissue surgery. And uh, the first question is from Dr. Ramani from Delhi, who says that, do you believe in the semitendinosus to adductus magnus transfer at all for uh, Hamstring. Hello. I have to uh, apologize. I'm having a very hard time understanding the, the question. So uh, uh, the question was, do you believe in the semitendinosus transfer to the adductor magnus for flexion contracture of the knee? Okay, thank you. So the question is, is uh, do I believe that semitendinosus transfer is an effective treatment for the knee in cerebral palsy? Yes. Um, so the, I can tell you that there is, uh, this is a procedure that we do not do very often at Gillette. And the big reason I would say for that is that most of our patients who might otherwise have been a candidate for a semitendinosus transfer instead have a rhizotomy. So the semitendinosus is a spastic muscle. I believe that a big reason to do the semitendinosus transfer is to treat the spasticity and likewise to maintain the function of the uh, semitendinosus as a hip extensor. So okay. in theory, it has a, a good reason. Uh, and I would say the big reason that we don't do it is because uh, of the rhizotomies. When right. so, Paulo was with us at Gillette in the 1990s, it was before we were doing DFEO PTAs, and it was uh, early in our experience with rhizotomy. 
And the patients that we were doing the semitendinosus transfer on at that time had a very aggressive hamstring lengthening procedure, both medial and lateral hamstrings, and we would never advocate for doing that now. Uh, and at that time, we were trying it. And unfortunately, we weren't seeing any clear benefit from doing it. So we started to move away from it. So that's been our history. I know that um, uh, Paulo and, uh, and Care have uh, been advocates for doing the semitendinosus transfer. Uh, and I have enjoyed reading their articles of, about it. I think there's a good uh, sense, a good uh, thought behind doing it. Um, the question is, is in the long term, it, how uh, effective is it? Right. So, so it looks like most of your uh, surgery has moved away from the soft tissue and more towards bony corrections coupled with SDRs. Is that right? Is it safe to say that? Yes. So I, I think that the other thing that I would say, I, I know that uh, uh, in Australia, um, they would advocate for identifying patients who are moving towards a fixed knee contracture early and doing the semitendinosus transfer to avoid the need for the extension osteotomy. Uh, so I think that that's also has a, a potential advantage. Um, unfortunately for our patient population, many of our patients are not in our system throughout their childhood, only a small percentage are. So oftentimes, uh, our numbers are skewed by the fact that many of our patients are referred to us late. So when they late, they come from elsewhere, late, we need to do the extension osteotomy. Right. So, so there, there are a few questions about rectus surgery. You haven't commented on rectus surgery. Do you do it concurrently with hamstring surgery or would you defer it for later? And is SOAS lengthening out of favor totally? Which procedure are you asking about? Can you type it in the chat? Uh, yeah, I, I will type it. Yeah, he, the, people are asking about rectus surgery, either rectus release proximally or uh, distal rectus transfer. What is your comment on that? Uh, so the question is about semitendinosus transfer, so is lengthening and rectus transfer? Rectus transfer as well as release. What is the status of rectus surgery? So rectus transfer versus release. Yes. That's the question. Yeah. So uh, yes, the, the history is for doing a rectus transfer. Uh, more recently, there's been a new interest again in the rectus release. Uh, as I read the uh, uh, articles, uh, well, first of all, let me, let me say this. We do not have clear, clear indications, nor a very good outcomes variable, a single variable that tells us about the knee stiffness in swing. So lacking the clear indications and lacking the clear outcomes variable, we have a very hard time identifying who is a candidate for rectus femoris transfer or uh, uh, lengthening uh, release uh, and who doesn't need it. Uh, so the historical indications being stiffness of the knee and swing, uh, abnormal EMG uh, of the rectus femoris during swing, and uh, rectus femoris spasticity on physical examination. Again, those things make sense. Uh, and it was uh, very uh, exciting when uh, Dr. Perry and Dr. Gage uh, identified those things in gait analysis and moved ahead uh, with doing those uh, procedures. Um, but there are patients who don't improve with rectus femoris surgery and patients who improve who don't have it. Uh, so there's a, a very mixed bag. We've looked very carefully at that uh, of rectus femoris transfer versus not. We have not studied the rectus femoris release. So again, I can say at our institution, we have not moved ahead with doing the rectus femoris uh, release in uh, very many patients. Um, some of the very late patients who have contracture and we do the patellar advancement, I'll do a rectus femoris release, uh, but that's, uh, that's about it. I think the literature that's available is mixed. Uh, again, I, I don't think we have any real clear guidance there, so I'm sorry I don't have a very good answer for you. Um, okay, and what about uh, intramuscular source lengthening at the brim? Yep. So. Um, the, your question is about the intramuscular lengthening of the psoas at the pelvic brim. 
Uh, yes. So you, you probably know that at our institution, I've been a, a co-author, <laughs> main author on four different articles about psoas lengthening. Uh, I can tell you that I've been a believer in doing the psoas. Uh, so I've been an advocate. There are other members of our group who were less uh, um, aggressive about it. And uh, so the, the advantage is, is that we had similar patients, some of whom had it and others who did not. Uh, and it has led us to do a better job of identifying the indications for that procedure. So prior to the use of the random forest algorithm to identify who's a good candidate, we had a success rate of about 58%. Uh, so that's not very good. Uh, it's better than 30% success. Uh, but 58%, and by following those indications, we've increased that success rate to about 75%. So the, the other thing that we have identified with these studies is that the, if you're trying to get an effect on hip kinematics and pelvic kinematics in the older patient, a psoas lengthening at the pelvic brim does not work. It's probably not enough. There's too much other secondary deformity. So if you're going to do a psoas lengthening, it needs to be uh, before age nine or 10. Uh, and after that, we need to find another solution. Okay. So in younger people, you would recommend doing it? Hello? Yes. What about the current use of uh, botulinum toxin? Like in which patients you use that? Is the question about botulinum toxin? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> sorry. I, I am really sorry about the quality of my audio. I, I apologize. Um, so the botulinum toxin should be used, can be used, but needs to be used in a minimum of way. Uh, so I'd be very interested to know what Paulo has to say about this. Uh, but I would say the younger patient who uh, has significant spasticity, who's only two to three years old, and you're trying to wait until they're four uh, years to eight years of age to do other interventions, uh, doing botulinum toxin uh, once uh, every six to 12 months and limiting the number of injections to three uh, seems to make sense. Uh, but I think that that's even, uh, uh, you, you could even call into question whether that's uh, safe to do. Unfortunately, some of our patients uh, who have, have had numerous injections, uh, and I do think that they have serious uh, permanent uh, muscle injury. Uh, Paulo, do you have comments? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I think amongst us, the orthopedic surgeons, we always had this instinct of not doing too much because you know it's the same as a, it's a it's a neurological or neurectomy done uh, uh, done uh, chemically. Initially, we thought that it was reversible, but now we're we're realizing that it's not so much. Uh, therefore, I think I, I, the the best use is to buy time. Uh, when you don't really want to intervene and, uh, and you're considering rhizotomy or other things and, uh, and then move on to something else. Okay. So, so there is another question. Uh, between uh, calcaneal lengthening using the MOSCA method versus the triple C, which one do you prefer and why? Uh, between the calcaneal osteotomy and is it the medial displacement osteotomy? Is that the question? No. Uh, between MOSCA's procedure and triple C. Between the ascalcis lengthening and the triple C? Yes. Yes. Um, I would say that the in our outcomes, a ascalcis lengthening by itself is almost never enough. You need to do something more. And even in addition to that, the outcome study that I showed showed, and I didn't have I couldn't didn't have enough time to show all the data, but doing the combined oscalcis lengthening with the first cuneiform plantar flexion osteotomy led to significant improvements, but there was still 
abnormality residual. They did not get to normal on many of the parameters. Some were normal, but not all. Um, so the I would say that at least you need to do those two procedures together. And in our experience, we are now moving ahead to do more often the triple C, uh, not just the double C. Okay, okay. Uh, also, there is a question. Uh, do transverse plane kinematics agree with radiological parameters every time? Sandeep, can you repeat the question? Yes, Jayant wanted to know, do transverse plane kinematics agree with radiological parameters every time? Which one should we trust? Can, can someone type it? Paolo, can you answer this question? Or Paolo, I'm do you hear it better? Sorry, you, I, I can understand it. you, Paolo, if you say it. I, no, I didn't understand it either. Sorry, I apologize. Okay. I've, I've, I have typed the question. You can read it. Does not agree with radiographic parameters. Which do we trust more? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a very, uh, very interesting. Uh, it is part of the reason that we've moved towards using the EOS uh, for <laughs> helping us with these measurements. Um, so we all know that uh, there's compensations in GAIT. It's one of the things that uh, gate analysis has been helpful to be able to differentiate the primary and secondary problems of uh, the neurological and the musculoskeletal from the compensations. But we still have some limitations. So one of those examples is the relationship between femoral antiversion and hip rotation. Uh, so when you do your kinematics, uh, you measure essentially the transverse plane offset between the knee joint axis the, or the femoral epicondylar axis, depending upon the model you're using, and the, uh, and the pelvic position. And uh, what you don't know is how much of that is antiversion and how much of it is compensatory hip rotation. So there is oftentimes a mismatch between the kinematics and the physical examination. So uh, the, what we've also recognized is that physical examination for femoral antiversion is not perfect. There is variability uh, uh, between examiners. Um, and uh, so uh, even using physical examination in addition to kinematics uh, doesn't give you the full picture. So uh, we have gone to using the EOS. The EOS is very accurate for uh, femoral antiversion. I think it's quite good for the uh, tibial torsion, but there's some nuance there. And if somebody really wants to know about that, they'll have to send me a note and I can try to answer it. Um, but yes, it's uh, oftentimes a, a big mismatch. Um, and I see the next question is, what is the best age to do semels in GMFCS one and two patients? Um, <clears throat> also a great question. I do believe that the group, group in Australia uh, has been a, a leader in uh, being the proponent for making sure that surgeries or uh, interventions are done at the correct times. Um, so we try to uh, delay our orthopedic surgeries at this point uh, to age eight to 11. Uh, we believe, um, and I think that's very consistent with what uh, they've uh, uh, done in Melbourne, um, before age eight, there's a risk of recurrence. Uh, after uh, age 11, it becomes difficult for rehabilitation. Uh, so uh, we believe that eight to 11 is, is the best age. So I've typed in the next two questions. Yep, so I see the uh, recent paper about consensus building amongst experts by the Delphi system. Yes, um, <laughs> very controversial. Um, so Jim McCarthy is a very smart guy and I trust him a lot. And, uh, so I agreed to be part of this group and I know that, uh, Kier Graham did as well. Uh, this is a multi-center group, uh, purported CP experts, uh, and, uh, trying to help the world, if you will, come to consensus about indications for different procedures. Um, I... For me, the, the big problem there is, is that there are major differences amongst us about who will do these procedures on and trying to come to agreement um, amongst 
the experts who have very different uh, uh, decision making uh, in mind uh, leads to, uh, you know, I think you'll get consensus on some things, but it's not a strong consensus, or it it eliminates the uh, it really minimizes the ability of a person who has a very strong different feeling to be visible in the write up. Um, however, uh, when I was deciding whether I was going to participate or not, for me, I felt like it was better that I participated than not participating because I thought that I could be a voice, you know, that might be uh, giving a different point of view. And I suspect that Care Graham uh, feels the same way. Um, you know, and I think that uh, what we were trying to do with that group was to pick off the most common procedures and try to provide some guidance about that. It wasn't to suggest that some of these common procedures should be done. Uh, so an example of that is the medial hamstring lengthening, and that's one of the things that we've reported on. Uh, so the reason that we picked that was because it's very common, unfortunately, and uh, that, um, that people wanted to know more about how the experts made that decision. Um, the, um, again, I guess the, the, I would just say that uh, that there was a, there's a lot of disagreement about the indications for that. And for again, for me at Gillette and our, our program, uh, we do very <coughs> few hamstring lengthening surgeries. And instead those patients are oftentimes treated with rhizotomy. We have uh, patients who have very tight physical examination, uh, hamstrings by physical examination, who aren't functioning poorly in gait and we're not doing hamstring lengthening. Um, if, if someone has another question about that that I didn't uh, get to with that Delphi system, uh, please let me know. Uh, uh, the next question I see. In, yes, Go yes. Ahead. No, I've just typed in the questions. So the next question is the hemi replacement in the non-reconstructable or shoulder prosthesis in a small size in, pa in, in uh, patients. So uh, the, that question is about hip dysplasia and is about mainly the GMFCS4 and five patients who have a painful uh, dysplastic hip. Uh, one of the options is, uh, is an implant, uh, either a formal hip replacement or a shoulder prosthesis. Um, the CHOP group that I mentioned, the uh, uh, CP Hip Outcomes Project, uh, also again, I should mention that that's led by Uni Narayan um, is uh, trying to uh, get answers to some of these questions. Uh, we've actually enrolled several hundred patients uh, across, uh, and they're all GMFCS four and five, uh, and it includes you know the reconstructable and the non-reconstructable. Uh, and one of the real interesting questions is: is in the non-reconstructable, what is the best option? Is it resection? Is it arthrodesis? Is it um, uh, replacement, uh, and, uh, or is it a valgus osteotomy? So uh, by doing the comparative out outcome effectiveness research, I think we'll start to get answers to those questions. Um, right now, we don't have, have those answers. I can say that at Gillette, uh, we don't have a complete uniform opinion about what to do with those hips either. Um, and uh, for, for myself, I previously had done the soft tissue resection, the proximal femoral resection with soft tissue interposition. I think that that uh, worked, but it leads to an abnormally uh, loose uh, leg and maybe some sitting issues. Uh, and more recently in the past uh, 10 to 15 years, I favored the valgus osteotomy uh, with uh, a femoral uh, neck resection. Uh, so that's been my, uh, my approach. How many ambulatory CP guys will have significant post acetabular deficiency to warrant PAO? Um, posterior. Yeah, posterior, yep. Uh, yes, so the percentages are low, uh, but it's not non-existent. So in the GMFCS3 patients, uh, we have an incidence of about uh, 10 to 15%. And the interesting thing is, is that with the vast majority is in the data that I showed you, uh, over 80%, it, the position of their deficiency is posterior. So if they have deficiency, it's almost certainly posterior, not always, but most of them are. 
Right. Um, and looking at long-term outcomes, is it reasonable to conclude that DFEO, PTA, SDR, FDO all improve form and some function, but do not really improve quality of life and ability? Great question. And that is what the data shows. Uh, and, you know, this is, of course, you know, what we're, you know, we as surgeons and treaters, you know, we're not just trying to improve the deformity, we're trying to improve the comfort and the function of the individual. Um, I can say that there are a couple of things about these uh, studies. First of all, if I had it to do over, if I could go back four years and start all three of those studies over, I would do them again. And I would do them pretty much the same way. The first one was the DFEO PTA, and we had a little mismatch in our uh, it, that out of our inclusion criteria that led to some differences at baseline. So I would do that one a little bit differently. So I think that that doesn't quite fully capture a true comparison. Um, the there is a lot of work being done, and I didn't actually mention it very much. I mentioned a lot of outcomes instruments, but I didn't mention things like the promise. Uh, so patient reported outcomes measures. Uh, uh, we're doing on a high uh, basis now uh, before uh, as a baseline for all of our patients. Uh, and I think that this will be a real key to picking the right outcomes tool. So I would say that one of the weaknesses is that uh, some of the outcomes tools, as good as they are, they still have, they probably don't get at absolutely everything. And the other point I would make about all of those long-term outcomes is that they're, yes, they're longer than anything else we've had, but they're not yet long enough. You know, if you look at adults with cerebral palsy and say, when do they start to really experience pain, decline, and decrease quality of life? It's probably in their 30s. And these outcome studies that we're reporting, uh, are made, most of these patients are in their 20s. So I don't think we've quite had enough time to see the two groups diverge. Okay. Great question. Right. So the next two questions are there. Yeah. Is it necessary to get radiographically perfect hips at maturity in GMFCS3? Do they really need aggressive surgery? Um, long story made short, I would say yes. Those patients are, they put significant stress on their hips. Having a normal hip may be even more important in my mind than uh, an idiopathic individual who is able to compensate in ways that a GMFCS3 patient can't. So uh, I would say, yes, I am very aggressive in those patients. I think you need to be aggressive to have a good radiographic outcome to preserve the hips. Um, and we don't have any long-term outcomes about the uh, acetabular osteotomies, you know, what I showed you was uh, basically radiographic uh, and short term. Okay. Uh, if, there's, if there's something else about that question that I missed, uh, please uh, ask it because um, I, I want to be sure that the reason for the question uh, that I was able to address it. Yeah. So, so I think there are no more questions as, uh, yeah, Deirin by uh, has typed in something. Uh, I see one more question. Uh, yes. Yes. Is it okay if I answer it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, in PTA, where do we aim the final position? Again, a great question. So, <laughs> um, long ago, when Dr. Gage and I started doing the patellar advancement procedure, uh, we judged the correction based on the soft tissue feel in surgery, how tight did it feel? And we pulled it down to the point where it felt like the knee flexion extension range of motion and the tension in the quadriceps was corrected. We found that that position was putting the inferior pole of the patella at the joint line. And if you have an AP x-ray, the inferior pole of the patella in the tibial spines. So right at that level. So it's at the joint line. That is clearly a radiographic overcorrection. 
but the results that we've shown uh, are based on that amount of correction. Is the, that one answer, is that the correct answer for all of our patients? Almost certainly not. But we have not yet identified the clear parameters in order to make different individual decisions for individual patients. So our answer remains the same, that we put the patella uh, at the tibial spines, the inferior pole at the joint line. Okay, um, there's one more question, Tom, if you could just take that. Paolo, do you, Paolo, do you have any other comments about that? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for such a brilliant presentation, uh, which didn't surprise me because that's what you always do. Uh, you put it all together so beautifully, thank you. Uh, I, think, I think the quality of life related to Crouchgate one of the things that we need to, uh, to realize is that we all walk with nearly full extension in mid stance. Uh, and that's why we have the quality of life that we have. I think mid stance full extension is crucial, but I also know how hard it is to get it. Uh, I think uh, this is a very, very, uh, uh, this is a very simple, humble comment. But I think if we are not able to achieve full knee extension in mid stance, we cannot say that we've achieved good correction. Uh, and therefore, I wonder if some of those quality of life uh, measures don't relate to that. Because you know me, Tom, I, I like analogies and, I like, and I've learned it from Jim like you have. Can you imagine yourself walking with 15 degrees of knee flexion throughout the day in mid stance? your quality of life is not gonna be as good because you're gonna be limited in many ways. That's one, one comment. So it's hard to achieve it because sometimes we do too much, sometimes we, we do too uh, not enough. And I, I think that the, the, the problem is the hamstring. We know that hamstrings lengthenings don't do the job. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you're not doing the, ham, the, the rhizotomy in everybody, like the, most of the world doesn't, and, and I think if you, if you continue to fight your hamstrings, even after PTS and supracondylar or PTA and supracondylar extension osteotomy, you want, you, want, you want to achieve that extension that you need. And that's why I think the semi-T has helped us so much because by taking semi-T away, what we've noticed was a, 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 a fantastic result, not only early on, but maintained. Kerr and I tried to, to publish a long-term result of semi-Ts, but we couldn't because we didn't have a, a comparative group because we've stopped doing medial hamstrings lengthenings a long time ago. Uh, the, the second thing that I, I'd like to say is that uh, what, what Tom talked about is a lot of the dosing thing that we, we talk about all the, all the time. Not a lot of people use that term, but that's exactly what we do nowadays. We, we choose different procedures to different people. And even the height of the patel at the end of the surgery needs to be dosed in many ways. And so uh, I think when we say, do you believe in this surgery or that surgery? I prefer to have a different take on that. Uh, I think the question should be reframed like, do you believe in this surgery for this patient? Because every patient has a different story and will uh, we'll deserve uh, in a different surgical dose. Thank you so much again, Tom. Yes, that was nice, Paulo. Really uh, pertinent comments. And uh, there's just one last question, Tom, if you could just answer that before we wind up. Uh, if I understood you correctly, so the last question is, uh, is hip displacement, uh, Reimers, yes. more than 40% as well as knee flexion more than 25 degrees and GMFCS3, which surgery to be done first? <coughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, our, um, in our hospital, I would say that we would do them both at the same time. Uh, this gets to be a lot of surgery, uh, and be, but because of our anesthesiologists and our post-surgical care uh, with the nursing staff and the physical therapists, uh, we would tend to do those things at the same time. So 
there would be patients that we do both a proximal and distal femoral osteotomy at the same time. And in the patients that I showed you who had the PAO, that was those patients were all as part of a SEML. So they all had other procedures done at other levels. Um, and uh, so that means that if they uh, also, if they're mature and they need a periacetabular osteotomy, we are including that as well. Um, and uh, we've been able to do that safely. Um, in, if you're not as confident uh, doing that much surgery under one anesthetic, or you maybe you don't have the surgical team, uh, I would tend to do the hip first uh, so that you can get started on the recovery with the uh, uh, rehabilitation from the hip. And then uh, part way through that uh, to do the knee because the knee recovery is faster. The hip recovery is slower. That's why I would choose it that way. Okay. So uh, let me thank you, Tom, for a really insightful uh, one and a half hour on how CP surgery has evolved, in, not only in Gillette, but how the philosophies have changed and the long-term outcome uh, studies were really interesting. And as you said, uh, we really don't know what is long-term unless it's maybe another 10 more years of their life. So uh, the last word yet remains to be said. Uh, having said that, it was brilliant, one and a half hour, which was not focused only on techniques, but you gave us an insight that as far as possible, try to delay the surgery with good orthotics and physiotherapy. Don't overdo the Botox. Try to avoid it as far as possible and concentrate more on bony surgery and do them as late as possible if I got you right. SDRs work for you, but unfortunately nobody does them in India. So we are still dependent on doing limited soft tissue surgeries, but we should probably be careful about them and uh, maybe warn the family that you might need to repeat them with bony procedures towards maturity. So with these few words, let me thank you again and uh, good night everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Paolo. Paolo, thank, thank you for you. your inputs. Yes. Goodbye. A pleasure. Thank you Take so night. much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Thank you Paulo. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Ashok, streaming man karo.